Okay, so no credit, like I said, that assignment that I passed out will cover all of chapter two. So instead of having one assignment per night, you just have one assignment for the whole chapter. Hey, Peach, I'm sorry, you'll have one assignment per night. And talk tonight has already been posted in Google Classroom. And it's also up there on the calendar on the board. If you want to snap a picture of that. Okay, everyone's giving me their test back. So the first chapter was more like an overview of statistics. I mean, that's what we called it. Overview of statistics. This chapter is going to look at actually getting the data. Actually getting the data for us to analyze. So one thing to note in this chapter, I don't think it's written on the notes, but correct usage of vocabulary is really important. For instance, we're going to use the word random a lot. If you put the word random in the wrong place, you could be talking about something totally different. The correct usage of vocabulary, very important. This first section, which we're going to get all the way through today, and then we're going to start section two of chapter two. And it's looking at just the difference between observation and experimentation. So just to get a gauge of how much y'all may already know, what are some examples that y'all could think of for an observation-based study? What changes? What changes? Yeah. Colors of a car that go through the intersection. Yes. What about an experiment? Well, I mean, even a science experiment would count. I mean, if you're trying to see how hot does a certain reaction get, and you run that over and over and over under, maybe you have the outside temperature different outside the container, you're changing something. So we want to consider some some of the headlines, some headlines. And we'll talk about what that study actually did once we read them. And the, these, I didn't make up. They're actual headlines that appeared not long after our study was released on September 25th, 2009. I haven't looked them up yet, but yeah, these are they were right below that first paragraph. So, one headline said spanking lowers a child's IQ. That was in the Los Angeles Times. Do you spank? Studies indicate it could lower your kid's IQ. That was, here, that was a little bit more local. That was in the Houston Chronicle. And the saga, I think that's a magazine. Spanking can lower IQ. That was put out by NBC in Columbus, Ohio. Smacking hits kids' IQ. That was put out by the New Scientist. I don't know why, but every time I see this last headline, I just start laughing. Like here they're talking about spanking, and then it elevates to smacking. Okay. So in this study that spawned these headlines, 
two groups of children were followed for four years. 806 children were ages 2 to 4, and 704 children were ages 5 to 9. Their IQ was measured at the beginning of the study, and then again four years later. Researchers found that the average IQ of children ages 2 to 4 who were not spanked was 5 points higher than those who were spanked. And then in the next age group from 5 to 9, they were 2.8 points higher. So, these headlines all imply, if you read them, it makes it seem like spanking causes the observed differences in IQ. Do y'all think that's a reasonable conclusion? Just based on what you know about spanking and your IQ. The spanking causes lower IQ. Mm -hmm. Then what? Doesn't seem like it's proven. Let's see what they say. They're saying no. Yeah. So on that one, I haven't read the study, so I don't know the exact study. But if they're doing, if they did just what that paragraph said, I mean, there's so many unknowns there. It depends on the study design. Do they just go up to random people and say, do you spank? Yes, okay, I'm, I'm stalking your child for the next four years. See if their IQ changes. Do you spank? No, okay, I'm still going to watch your child for the next four years. So there's just so many different unknowns here. Let's look at observation versus experimentation. We're going to put that example on hold for a second and look at two examples, two other examples. The first one, a social scientist is studying a rural community and wants to determine whether gender and attitudes towards abortion are related. Using a telephone survey, 100 residents are contacted at random and their gender and attitude towards abortion are reported. Okay, that's one example. The next one. A professor might wonder what would happen to final test scores if the required lab time for a chemistry course is increased from three hours to six hours. For 100 chemistry students, half were randomly assigned to the three-hour lab and half to the six-hour lab. Oof, that kind of lab for six hours. Yikes. The rest of the course remained the same for the two groups. The difference in their final test scores will be examined. So those are two different studies. How do these two examples differ? What do y'all think? Can they give you some ideas to think about? Well, they're just asking in general how do they differ. So, like, first question how are the groups determined in the first one? They what? Yeah. Yep, so in the well that's the second one, how much time they spent in lab, that determines the groups. The first one, there weren't really any groups. They just called randomly. Were there any variables that they tried to control in this first one? What about the second one? Fine, yep. Uh, and then what did the researcher do? So what did they do in the first one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just surveyed at random. 
They're probably one of the ones you call and are like, you have a few minutes for a survey? Uh, no thank you, but... <laughs> Second one, they actually had a method. Half of them were put in one lab, half were put in the other, reading them. So which do you think was the experiment and which do you think was the observational study? That's right. And if you want to go on there and write that on there, you can. The experiment was the three to six hour one. The first one, that first one where they call about abortion, that one was just observation based. They didn't try to control anything yet. Okay, so let's look at the formal definitions. So an observational study is a study in which the researcher observes characteristics of a sample selected from one or more populations. You're just, like it says, you're just observing. So, example Olivia gave at the beginning of class, just cars go through intersections. An experiment is a study in which the researcher observes how a response variable behaves when one or more explanatory variables are manipulated. So that's like the one that we talked about up above with the chemistry lab. They manipulated the lab time. And the response was how well they did on the test. So a well-designed experiment can result in data that provides evidence for a cause and effect relationship. I'm not saying it will, but it can result if it is well designed. If it's not well designed, then we may not be able to say one causes the other. So let's go back to our IQ example. I'm going to give you all about a minute or two to write on the next page. This is questions at the top of the next page. I want you all to answer the question, does spanking cause a decrease in IQ? Why or why not? So pick a side and then write maybe one or two reasons why or why not on the spanking cause. <laughs> I'm the next page. We're, we're referencing that example, but the question itself is on the next page.
Okay, so what did some of y'all say? The spanking caused a decrease in IQ, and then why or why not? Why or why not? Is that supposed to be like kind of more opinionated? Or more opinionated? Yeah, that, this one can. Try to use the data as much as you can, but they didn't really give us too much data. So what do y'all think? I know y'all said no earlier, but what what was your why? Or your why not, I should say. There's other things that influence the kid. Good. Let's see what they said. Let's see what Taha said. No, just because spank kids have lower IQ, it doesn't mean spanking caused the lower IQ. That could have just happened to occur in those specific kids based on other factors like learning environment, etc. Perfect. So environment could impact it. Or like we talked third period talked about, chances are if you got spanked, you probably weren't the brightest anyways. <laughs> I mean, if you if you got spanked, it's probably because they told you no already and you just kept trying to do it. Like stop. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Five to nine is one range, and then two to four is the other range. So, one group you're looking at a five year difference, the other group like a three year. So, like, if you go, whenever you put like, you put calls and like bolded. Uh -huh. All that was up. So that wasn't implying that it wasn't. It's like, it's not really directly like correlated there. Like, it's just like coincidental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that spanking the child lowered their IQ? That's what it's saying. And we already kind of answered the next part of this will to the next slide. There it is. Are there other variables connected? We already said it could be learning environment, uh, education of the parents to affect their IQ, and socioeconomic status. Those all could impact their IQ. I mean, honestly, just on a personal note, which, well, for stats wise, I don't rec recommend putting my personal experience in your answers. But I think this study isn't any good. I mean, my parents spanked my brother and I, and now I didn't go and take IQ tests every time you turn around, but I don't feel like the spanking caused me to lose IQ points. We have time, I'll tell y'all a story that I told third period about spanking and growing up. So the variables that could impact the other groups are called confounding variables. So what are confounding variables? They're 
a variable that's related to both group membership and the response variable in a research study. So if it impacts the group membership and the response variable, then it's a confounding variable. So because observational studies may contain confounding variables, their result cannot be used to show cause and effect. So you can't use this experiment to say one causes the other because this wasn't, or I say, I shouldn't say the word experiment. We can't use the study because it was not experimental. It was just, do you spank? Yes or no? That's observation. Observational studies can be generalized to the population if the sample is randomly selected from the population of interest, but again, cannot show cause-effect relationships. So where that comes in is we could say something like, generally, those who get spanked have a lower IQ. So we can't say spanking causes lower IQ. It would just they would just be possibly correlated with each other. Well-designed experiments can show cause and effect, but cannot be generalized to the population if the groups are volunteers or are not randomly assigned. So if you've watched TV and you see those commercials, or it's like, do you suffer from this? Are you a middle-aged male suffering from blah, blah, blah? You may qualify for this study. Call this number and see if you qualify. Participants will be paid X number of dollars a day. You're volunteering. So how valid can our studies really be? So let's look at sampling. We talked about how, you know, if you sample one way, it could show cause and effect. If you sample another, it may not. So Let's actually talk about sampling. How do you sample? So first we have census versus sample. Who remembers what a census is? Our population. It's our whole population, that's right. A sample is just that, part of the population. So obtaining information about the entire population it's called a census. We talked about that in chapter one. Why, what were some reasons we talked about that we might prefer to select a sample rather than the whole census? Cost, yeah. What else? Work. Time, the amount of work, yeah. Okay. Too much data? Yep. Here's one we didn't talk about earlier. You you destroy the item. So if you were measuring how long batteries lasted. Well, once you use a battery, done. Assuming it's not rechargeable. We're going to throw that one out. We're not going to say, what about No, throw it out. We're not using those. Just plain batteries. 
once you use a battery, it's destroyed. So if we wanted to do a population, do a census on every battery used, it's going to be a lot of batteries, but then once we use them all, we won't have any left. The safety ratings of cars. If you took 20, 21 Honda Civics and wanted to do their safety rating, what would happen if you used the whole population? You wouldn't have any more Honda Civics. <laughs> if you did, then they either are really, really, really safe so much so that it doesn't make a mark on them. They're just basically armored vehicles at that point. Or they really found out how to rebuild every one of them. Like me. Get to the wreck. Comes out of the ring brand new. Like it didn't even happen. Another example I gave last period was, let's say you were doing an experiment to see how many rubber bands you could put around a watermelon until it exploded. If you did a census, we wouldn't have any watermelons left. I mean, you could, because I feel like it would be that one person. I'm not giving them a watermelon. See if they found this one. So that kind of goes to the next one. Difficult to find the entire population. Somebody's going to have a watermelon because they don't want to all be lost. So, another example of the entire population is the finding the length of every fish in the lake. Think of how difficult it would be to go out to Sam Rayburn, catch every single fish, and measure it, but you can't have any repeats. Yeah, it'd be pretty much it'd, it'd be very much impossible. Yeah, especially being that fish are not only caught or fed each day, but then I'm sure fish are hatched each day. So, yes, I, I caught the last one today. It takes, exactly. Yeah, so that, that would be yeah, pretty much impossible. And then we mentioned this already, limited resources, time and money. Now, if you want to pay me to try to catch every single fish in the lake, you're gonna let you're gonna tell me that's my job. Sure, I'll I'll, be, I'll sign up for that. You're gonna you're you give me a living salary to go catch every fish and measure it. Yeah, I'll do it. Sign me a boat too. Sure, sign me up. And this last one's the most common reason that we use a sample. It takes too much time and money. Let's look at sampling. There's just no way to tell. It, let's say we get an experiment, we're reading through it, or we get some kind of study done. I need to quit saying the word experiment unless I'm talking about an experiment. Let's say we get a study, the results back, you can't tell unless they tell you whether the sample is representative of the whole population. Our only assurance comes from the method they use to select the sample. So if they tell you we, do, we use this method, then our only assurance is the extent of that method. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of the lecture talking about. Different methods of sampling. There's four, four key methods here. So let's introduce another, we're going to lay the IQ example to rest and introduce another one talking about cell phones. So let's suppose a local school has 2,000 students. We want to survey 100 students about the current cell phone policy. A sample of students can be selected by putting each student's name on individual but identical slips of paper. 
and placing them in a large container. After mixing well, randomly select 100 names from the container one at a time. One thing I will make note of, and those of y'all in AP, you may also want to make note of this. This piece right here, the individual but identical slips of paper, that's really important. Yes, they're individual slips of paper, but they have to be identical. And here's the reason why it's important in this case. If you ever put your name into a drawing, you like write your name on the paper, some people just fold it, drop it in there. But some people are also like, ooh, if I make this into an origami bird, they might fill that in the container and draw my name. So they sit there and fold it a million different ways and drop it in there. Well, then they're not identical. So that's why I was saying that that those two words, the identical, are important. And if you're running a raffle, I've, I've actually seen someone do this. A person buys a raffle ticket, fills it out, get, folds it up drops it in there and they fold it all in a weird way. The minute they turn around and walk off, the person that sold them the ticket, if they saw them do that, they'd turn around, take the ticket out, fold it over like normal, and then drop it back in there. So he spent all that time trying to get it nice and neat and special, but then that means he had an advantage, which wouldn't be fair. But anyways, this is what we call a simple random sample. So a simple random sample takes a sample of size n. In our case, in that example we just talked about, it was size 2. Wait, no. Sample is size 100. We picked 100 from the population in a way that ensures Every different possible sample of the desired size has the same chance of being selected. So the probability that you select all 100 seniors would be the exact same as if you selected 25 from each grade. It's possible for all 100 students in the sample to be seniors. And those of y'all that aren't seniors, you probably don't want the seniors speaking on your behalf. But if we're juniors, we have our own opinion. They just think they're the king of the school. And then the seniors are sitting there, think we know we're the kings. A simple random sample does not guarantee the sample is representative of the population. I mean, the freshmen probably would not agree with what the seniors said. And vice versa, the seniors probably wouldn't agree with what the freshmen said if the freshmen all got picked. So, that's just the simple random sample definition again. Oh, wait, hang on. Uh, no. I don't know if y'all caught that. That was, there was a word on page three in this box. So, on the top of page three, if you didn't catch that word, representative. So, a simple random sample does not guarantee the sample is representative of the entire population. Okay, so how do we get our sample? There's something called a sampling frame. It's the list of all objects or individuals in the population. So all 2,000, going back to our cell phone example, all 2,000 
would be listed on that sample frame. So let's see, another way to select a simple random sample is to create a list of all students in the school called the sampling frame. We already said that. Yes. What is that last slide? Why is that talking about a simple random sample? Okay. That blank was representative. Uh -huh. Let's see. What does. Uh, you said that it said uh, representative. Uh, it was that box, that green box at the bottom, representative. I kind of flew through that one. That was my fault. So we can write the names down of all 2,000 and then sit there and fold each piece of paper. Or we can number them 1 to 2,000 and then use a random number table or random number generator. Let me get to that point. So, Number each student in a unique way from 1 to 2,000. Use a random digit table or a random number generator, meaning a calculator or computer, to select the 100 students for the sample. Now, for our purposes, a calculator or a computer would be good enough to do random numbers. However, just know that those numbers are not actually random. Because in computer programming, for a random number generator, they have what's called a seed. So when you go to generate random numbers, you don't supply the seed. You just say, I need random numbers. But it'll drop a seed in there, and an algorithm will sit there and generate the random numbers. So if you have all the time in the world and all the money in the world, you can break that algorithm and figure out. Wait a minute, this isn't random. If I do this 20 million times, I'll start repeating my pattern. But anyways. On page 760 of your textbook, they have a random digit table. But I've also included it on your notes. We're going to kind of learn how to use it. So what we want to do, first, let's think about... How many students did we have in our example? We had 1 to 2,000, right? So since our students are numbered 1 to 2,000, we're going to select four-digit numbers from the table. So we would just start, you know, this starts us at row 6, and we would, like, look at the first four digits. If the number, if those four digits, when you squeeze them together, make a number 1 to 2,000, then we keep it. If not, we ignore it. So let's look at that first number. 0938. Is that between 1 and 2,000? Yes. So we want to keep that number. Yeah, let's circle it. I wouldn't circle all these as it shows up circled, but if we say yes, keep, then circle it. Yeah. Then we look at the next group, 7679. Don't circle this one yet. Would we keep that one? No, it's bigger than 2,000. So we cross it out. What about the next number? 
9562. Do we keep that one or do we throw it out? It's bigger than 2000, so we throw it out. What about the next group of four? 5658. Five, keep or throw out? Throw out. Bigger than 2,000. What about the next one? 4264. We're going to throw it out. Bigger. And you basically keep going through the table in that same fashion. So 4101. Throw it out. Too big. O two two O. That's two twenty. So yeah, keep it. We're between one and two thousand. Four seven five one. Too big, so we toss it. Nineteen forty seven. Keep that one. 9751. Too big. Toss it. 6473. Too big. Toss it. And we keep, like I said, we just keep going. 6345 is too big, so we toss it. 1231. That fits. We keep it. One eight oh oh. That fits. We keep it. Four eight two zero. Too big. Toss. Eight zero two eight. Toss. Seven nine three eight. Toss. Four zero four two. Toss. Oh eight nine one. We'll keep that one. And two three three two. That's out. So we just kept going. Now it took us that long to do four lines. Imagine if we had to keep doing this until we circled a hundred numbers. <laughs> That's what? That's what you have to do using a random digit table, yes. No. We it it would be way faster to just use a random number generator. You just press enter and pfft, here's all your numbers. Even if you need to do it a hundred times, just hit enter, write the number down, enter, write the number down, enter. That would be way quicker than going through this table four digits at a time. Now, when we do a simple random sample, most often sampling is done without replacement. So once an individual or object is selected, they are not replaced and cannot be selected again. Think of it like you went to some dinner, some fancy dinner, and everyone in there won a door prize, or had their name put in for a door prize. Once. Once your name gets drawn, yay, you won a prize, but can you win again? No, your name's already drawn. Hope you're happy with your prize. Sampling with replacement allows an object or individual to be selected more than once for a sample. So if you want a door prize, they throw your name back in. You can win again. There was a, it wasn't sampling with replacement. But just as far as a raffle goes, 
one year or well, every year the school I grew up, the FFA chapter, made a picnic table, a short trailer with a ramp on it to haul like a four wheeler or a side by side, and a barbecue pit. And every year at the show they would sell raffle tickets and we my family hardly ever won anything. I mean we just <laughs> we were not the luckiest bunch. One year my mom bought five raffle tickets. We won the picnic table and the trailer. Our next door neighbor won the barbecue pit. But really, what are the odds of that happening? My like, well, we just okay. He wants to just hook up to the trailer because everything was already on the trailer. He wants to just hook up to the trailer and take the pit to your house. I mean, <laughs> why unload it when it's going to the same place basically? But that's random sampling. So all those sampling with and without replacement are different. They can be treated as the same when the sample size is relatively small compared to the population. Meaning you can't have more than 10% of the population. So that's simple random sampling. Which you'll often see abbreviated SRS. Now let's talk about stratified random sampling. So with our cell phone example, this would be like surveying, getting a sample of 25 in each grade level. 25 freshmen, 25 sophomores, 25 juniors, 25 seniors. And they would do the survey. That's stratified random sampling. So in this case, the population is divided into non-overlapping subgroups called strata. So you can't be a junior and a senior at the same time. You're either a junior or a senior. Based on what your credits say. So they're not overlapping. Strata are groups that are similar or homogenous based on some characteristic of the group members. So they're all freshmen, they're all sophomores, etc. Simple random samples are selected from each stratum. So that they sweat each class. Sometimes it's easier to implement and more cost effective than some ones. Notice it doesn't say all the time, it just says sometimes it's easier. And it sometimes allows for more accurate inferences about a population than simple random sample. So if we were doing that cell phone example, if we picked 25 freshmen, 25 sophomores, juniors, and seniors, that would give us a look at basically every grade level. That would be more accurate than doing a simple random sample where you could get all juniors. Well, that's okay, so that's a great sample of the junior class, not everyone else. So that that was stratified random sampling. 
Now let's look at cluster sampling. It's going to start off the same way. We're going to select a sample of students to answer our survey. But this time, we're going to pick five classrooms during second period. And every student has to do the survey in that room. So I don't have a second period, but it'd be like if y'all were second period and they came in, you've been selected to do the survey, you can't leave the room until you do it. That's cluster sample. Not necessarily a whole Boston situation where you can't leave until you do it, but hopefully I'll get the, the picture. Okay, so why are you doing like you pick like a group Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You pick a group at random, you look at all the second periods in the school, and then maybe you number those one to however many there are. And then just draw five. So it's so it's just like less specific on like a person to person thing. Okay. Now, where you could run into problems, well, let's go through these and then we'll talk where you could run into problems. So the population is divided into non-overlapping subgroups called clusters. So in our case, the clusters would be the second period classes. And they're not overlapping because if you have an eight second period, you can't have Mr. Anton next door second period. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> you can only be in one place at a time. So they're not overlapping. And they're often based on location. With this being said, it's best if the clusters are heterogeneous. Subgroup from the population. Here's where we'd run into a small problem. Because if your second period is English 2, for instance, I think everyone's beyond English 2, but just go with me here. Everyone in English 2 would be sophomores, hopefully. Well, then they're not exactly heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, how would you say that word? Because they're all sophomores, so they have something else in common. So you can run into a problem there. But chances are, if you pick even this class, you pick this class. Some of y'all are seniors, some of y'all are juniors, so there's a mix. So this, so like this thing would be better than just like a class where everybody's like a sophomore earlier? Correct. Correct. So you randomly select the clusters, and then all the individuals in the cluster are included in the sample. Cluster sampling is often easier to perform and more cost effective. We already kind of mentioned why it's easier because you pick five rooms, you go to those five rooms, you get your samples done. I mean, cost effective, let's say you want to get them done at the same time so the rooms can't communicate with each other. You get five people. Send them out to the five rooms, they do the surveys all at the same time, then you're done. We're about to go through it. I went back to some of y'all. I saw some of y'all still writing. And now, the last one. Let's do systematic sampling. So suppose we randomly select a number between 1 and 20. So I open my random number table. This one you could use the random number table. Just flip to it, put your finger on two numbers, and this between 1 and 20, use it. So let's say I land on 13. So then we go through an alphabetical list of the students at our school, starting with 13, and then every 20 after that, 
will be picked. So 13, then 33, then 53, 73, etc. This is what you call systematic random sampling. So systematic sampling, a value k is specified. That's the first step. Then one, so our k in this case was 20. Then one of the first 20 individuals is selected at random. Then every 20th after that is included in the sample. So we pick 13, and then we go 33, 53, 73, 93, etc. This works reasonably as long as there are no repeating patterns in the population list. So if for whatever re weird reason, let's say the list went, it's alphabetical, but somehow it still went female, female, male. Female, female, male, etc. That's a repeating pattern that occurs over and over and over and over. So that may not work because if each time you just happen to do it to where it lands on female, well then your sample is going to be all female, no males whatsoever. So let's identify, some practice, identifying the different types of samples. So the first one, wait, I, I wasn't paying attention. Did I get that last blank? No repeating pattern. No repeating pattern. And so I'm like, ah, there's a blank there. I almost feel like I need to go through and underline where all the blanks are that way. Yeah, oh, it's underlined. We may want to see if we need to write it down. Okay. First example. The Educational Testing Service needed a sample of colleges. So first, they divide all colleges into groups of similar types. Small public, small private, medium public, medium private, large public, large private. Then, they randomly select three colleges from each group. What kind of sample would this be? Let's see. Okay, they're saying cluster over here. The same stratify. So if you're saying cluster, why do you think cluster? Why do you think stratify? Because there's multiple strata. That's right. Olivia got it right. It's stratify. Because the strata or the toxicologists, small, medium, large, and then they go to each group and pick three. Cluster would be like they pick medium public and then all medium public schools must answer. But then they probably wouldn't group them like that. They'd probably group them by region. Maybe even county or something. Next one. A county commissioner wants to survey people in her district to determine their opinions on a particular law up for adoption. She decides to randomly select blocks in her district and then survey all who live on those blocks.
What kind of sample do y'all think this is? That's a cluster. Yeah. This last sentence gave it away. The, the last six words of seven. Survey all who live on the wall. That's cluster. And the last one. A local restaurant manager wants to survey customers about the service they receive. So each night, he randomly chooses a number between 1 and 10. He then gives a survey to that customer and to every 10th customer after them to fill out before they leave. What do y'all think on that one? It is systematic, yes. So, as far as where we're going to stop today, that's a good spot. Because the next example, the FDR survey, that's going to lead us into bias. So we'll start with bias tomorrow. Yes. You said you did tutoring or not? Yeah. When did you do it? I have virtual tutoring. Start, it started yesterday, so I'll do virtual. And then for stats, I'm doing virtual and in person at the same time. All right. When is the, so, when is the in person? Uh, I'll, I'll be here today until 5. And then, but today would be a ride on your own. So if you ride a bus, you would have to get a ride on your own. Uh, the one where they start providing bus transportation for in person is next week. But this class tutoring uh, will be in person. I can do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. Virtual Tuesday, Wednesday will be virtual and in person. I'll make them, I'll make them. If I'm here, my door is open. You can come in. Yes. Yeah, that's fine.